Aleluia. 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 We worship you, Lord, and we exalt you. We thank you, Lord God, that you did not create us to worry. You did not create us to fear. But you created us, as Lord, this morning to worship you daily, Lord. And here we are, Lord, in your presence. Lord, we will trust you this morning. We will exalt you this morning. We will depend upon you this morning, Lord, because you did not create us to worry. Hallelujah. What an assurance this morning. What an assurance this morning that we were not created to worry. Beloved, is if ever time there are need, there are things that are in and on us that will push us into worrying. It is now. It is now, beloved. But this morning, the songwriter says, I will trust in you. A pleasant good morning to each and every one present here. And I just want to say thank you to Bishop Nelson for allowing me to stand here to minister what the Lord has laid upon my heart. And I pray this morning that my words or the words from God will be clear. That you will understand what the Lord is saying to you this morning. I'll be reading from Isaiah 43 verse 1 to 5. Isaiah 43 verse 1 to 5. And it reads us. But now thus saith the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I come before you, Lord, as a lump of clay. Lord Jesus, even now, I invite your Holy Spirit in this place. Lord, he's already here, Lord, but we, oh God, we want to extend further welcome to him this morning. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place this morning. And we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord God, this morning that you have placed upon my heart, Lord, what to give your, your, your people, Lord. And I pray this morning that every word will come with clarity. Lord, that every word, Lord Jesus, will come as an encouragement to the believers. And it will come, Lord Jesus, as Lord Jesus, a, a recommendation for the unsaved this morning. I pray, Lord God, this morning that everything will be said to the honor and to the glory of your name. And only you, Lord, will get the glory this morning. 
Father, I thank you, Lord. I just thank you, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for such an opportunity, Lord, and that, Lord Jesus, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, my topic to you will be fear not, believe God. Fear not, believe God. Norman Geisler, in his book, From God to Us, in describing the Bible, he wrote, and I quote, the Bible is a unique book. It is one of the oldest books in the world, yet it is still the best seller. It is a product of ancient Eastern world, but it's molded in, it molded the Western world. Tyrants have burned the Bible, and believers revere it. It is the most quoted, quoted, most published, most translated, and most influential book in the history of mankind. End of quote. The Bible is the word of God. It has power, it gives power, it releases grace, it is our guide, our daily bread. We must read it, reverence it, love it, meditate on it, and most importantly, ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand it. Because if we misuse or misread the Bible, it can spell trouble. Trouble to us as believers and trouble to our listeners. You see, if we pull out, pull out, stretch, and inflate one verse from the Bible to fit any situation, you can let the word of God embrace and support any worldly or sinful behavior. Let us look at how that can happen. First Timothy 5, 23 says, Stop drinking water, but drink wine for the stomach's sake. The drunkard can use this to support his bad habit. Isaiah 3, verse 1 says, Go love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, the fornicator. And the adulterer can use this as a go-ahead to do his sinful action. Exodus 21 and 24 says, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, the hostile and the aggressive person may use this for their defense. But this morning, we can see that these Scriptures, these verses, you don't, you don't see a lot of it in the Bible. So you will have to dig deeper to understand the message that it's bringing to come to a conclusion. But there are some commands and phrases in the word of God that you will see on more than one occasion. Commands like pray, rejoice in the Lord, give thanks unto the Lord, Praise the Lord. We read of the mercies of God, the blessings of God, and the love of God. And this morning, fear not. Do not be afraid. Have no fear. It's consistent. It's, it is a consistent command you see over and over in the word of God. In almost all the 66 books of the Bible, you can see something, uh, something um, that mentions or uh, uh, implies do not fear. We can remember that fear starts in the Garden of, um, in the, the, the garden of Eden. When mankind sin and they know that they disobeyed God. They become fearful and they went and hide. Whilst Jesus was on this earth, he used the term, do not be afraid, a lot with his disciples and with other persons who came to him. To the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, when 
When he heard that his 12-year-old daughter was sick, he came to Jesus to heal her. And Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. Believe and she will be healed. I remember when Jesus was walking on the water. And his disciples thought it was a ghost coming towards them. Jesus said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. When the woman, the women went to the tomb to look for Jesus when he was buried, they realized that the risen Christ is not there. And they become afraid. And Jesus met them on the way. And he said to them, do not be afraid. At the Mount, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was taken up into heaven, the disciples became terrified. Jesus touched them. And he said, have no fear. It is important, beloved, for us to realize that Jesus wants us to trust him. While he was here on earth, he teach, he preach, and he, he beseech this, this, his disciples not to be afraid. No matter what challenges we face today, no what, matter what ball like, um, life throw at you, this morning, but with confidence, but with assurance, but I know that Jesus is with you because he says, when you go through the waters, when you go through the waters, when you go through the fire, it, it, it will not burn you. This morning, we want to take God's word as it is. We don't have to dig deep and search the scriptures what Jesus means. It is he meant, do not be afraid. The Bible teaches us not to be afraid. Jesus wants us to put our faith and our trust in him, to depend upon him, to rely on him, to believe in him. What is fear? Fear is a normal natural flight response to a suspected danger. When fear comes, your heart races. Your body becomes tense, goosebumps, sweating, and sometimes you can't even think straight. Fear will keep you from fulfilling your destiny. The destiny that God has on our lives. But God knows we have the inclination to fear. That's why he repeated it over and over and over in the Bible. So we can see it every time we take up the book. We can see that we need not to be afraid. Fear comes natural. Sometimes we don't even have to make an effort to become fearful. It will be a part of our lives, but it's how we react to it. When fear comes, how do we treat it? Do we hug it up and say, yes, I am afraid, and you go into your closet and lock away? Fear can paralyze you to death. Let us look, in, look on two persons in the Bible. When fear came, how they treated it. I encourage you to turn to 1 Kings 19, verse 1 to 5. I'll be looking at Elijah. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. When Jezebel heard, she sent out a message to, to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. 
And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under the broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Elijah, he was a prophet in the land of Israel. His name means Yahweh is my God. He was no ordinary prophet. I will encourage you this morning to read 1 Kings 17 straight to 2 Kings um, chapter 2 just to see the life of Elijah until he was taken up into heaven by chariots of fire. Elijah was one of the most interesting, famous prophets who God used to bring the nation of Israel against a wicked king. Let, let me just summarize some of it, some things that happened before chapter 19. He was the same prophet that was fed by night and day by raven. He was preserved during a the time of famine. He experienced God's provision by a miraculous multiplication of flour and oil. He brought back to life the widow's son. In what I called the true God test, one of the most miraculous events in the Old Testament, where he challenged Ahab the king to gather the nation along with 450 Baal, um, prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The, I call it a, a competition. Because he told Heb to gather the 450 prophets and they are going to set up their sacrifice, you know, bull, the, the meat. They're going to get two bullocks and they are going to, Elijah is going to have one, they are going to have one. And they are going to cut up their bullock, put it on their wood and call on their God. And Elijah will do the same. But when they set up their, their sacrifice, they call on their God. They call on their God. They call from morning till noon. No answer. No answer. And I think Elijah was a little boasty about his God. So he said to them, call a little louder, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's on a journey. Perhaps he is sleeping and will awaken. Call a little louder, maybe he's running down the enemies. Call him, man. Call him. And the prophets did not, could not hear from their God. And they whipped themselves into a frenzy, lacerating themselves with swords and spears. Anything at all. They did anything to get Baal to respond. But nothing came. Can you imagine? You put in your trust in this God. And now you want him to prove himself and him, him not responding. Could he respond though? So when it was Elijah's time, after Elijah set up his, um, his altar, he never just make few months stay like, oh, for them months stay. For them never have no water. And we know that when water is in wood, it can't light. 
You couldn't try for they couldn't try for, for light from now till the morning. It cannot light. So Elijah instructed the men or the people to fully top a waterman. Fully it up. Three, three, um, Twelve different pitchers of water was poured on Elijah's sacrifice. I'm, I'm just trying to show you the man, Elijah. And when, I mean, his sacrifice was soaked and around his sacrifice, there was a trench that was filled with water. Can you imagine? Now they must have said, yeah man, I'm going to put enough water in there because I know it's not going to light. But because Elijah knew whom he trusted, he knows who his God is. Maybe even if the seed is around it, it would still light because that's the God that we serve. The, the scripture says, then Elijah prayed to God. And Elijah's prayer was answered. A godly fire came down and consumed the entire offering, including all the water, the stones, and the earth that built the altar. Then the people fell on their faces and cried out, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. In all of the recorded history of God's people, no one can be compared to the courage and faith of Elijah. Elijah knew he could boast about the power of his God. He defeated all of Baal's prophets with the weapon of prayer in, and faith in God. It is said that in all of Elijah's life, he performed 16 different miracles. He was a God man. We would say that he was a God man. Yet we read when Ahab went home and told Jezebel that what Elijah has done, she threatened to kill him. And the Bible said, he was afraid and he ran for his life. The faithful, courageous man of God flee for his life. The man who stood firm in his obedience and courage for God ran for his life. And this just shows us that when we are open for these emotions right after a spiritual victory. But God is still in control and will guide us through difficult times. Elijah grappled with fear until he asked God to take away his life. He became so weak and depressed. I just want to stop here and encourage us as believers that it's not impossible for us to go through depression. That's why we have to keep our focus in God and take him at his word. Believe in God, brethren. So the next person I'll be looking at is Jehoshaphat. He was the king of Judah, a good king, who reigned for 25 years. He became king at the age of 35. He also was faced with a challenge. Let us look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'll read, verse, I'll read from verse 2 to 5. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in 
Azazon, Tamar, that is Engedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Israel. And Judah, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. And all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Jehoshaphat, like Elijah, was faced with fear. They were faced with their life was at risk. But what did Jehoshaphat do when fear came? The scripture says Jehoshaphat was afraid and he set his face to the Lord. You see the difference? Elijah ran for his life when fear came. But, Eli but Jehoshaphat set his face to see the Lord. A very different approach. He sought God, beloved, when, when we pray, we touch the heart of God. Prayer is saying to God, I, can do, I can't do this without you. Please do it for me. Fight this battle for me. Help my unbelief. It is saying, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. It is saying, my faith looks up to thee. Oh, Lamb of Calvary. It is saying, when the storms of life are raging, God, stand by me. It is crying out to Almighty God to send help. Prayer changes things, beloved. And prayer not only changes things. It changes everything. Everything that you pray to God about, change come. Jehoshaphat saw the Lord. He turned to God for help. Prayer calms our fears and brings peace to a troubled mind. In addition, Jehoshaphat fasted. He sought spiritual strength and and God's intervention against the enemy just by abstaining from food. Verse 4 tells us that he did not just stand there. He called for backup. He called on others with the same interest to help him in fasting and prayer. Many times we are faced with situations and we try to go through it all, on all, all alone. But the scripture tells us over and over to, about the tools and more. One, the scripture said in Leviticus 26 verse 8 says, One shall chase a thousand, but two shall put ten thousand to flight. And Jehoshaphat didn't just stop there. He didn't just call a, call a fast call fasting and prayer and list and, and, and encourage others to do the same. He reminded God of who he God is and who he God is to him. Let us look at verse 6. And Joseph had said, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, O oh God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? Give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, friend, and they have lived in it and have built you an altar in its, in its sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster come upon the world, the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before the house 
before you, for your name is in this house. And we cry out to you in affliction, and you hear and save. And now, behold, men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, when you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and when they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us. O oh, our Lord, O oh God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless. For we are powerless against this great word that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. This was Jehoshaphat's approach. He called God into remembrance. He reminded God of his doings in the past and what the Almighty God can do. The psalmist David tells us that God's promises gives him hope in the midst of his affliction. And he encourages us to remind God of his promises. Jehoshaphat did not only sought answers to his problem. He sought the face of God. So what was the answer to all of that prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed? Verse 14 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came. You can get God's attention by praying and fasting and beseeching him. Whenever we do that, brethren, we get God's attention. When we cry from the bottom of our hearts and give him our concern, he will answer. We can get God's attention when we pray to him. So this, this chapter four, verse 14 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came. And he said, Listen, all Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord. Here it comes again. Thus saith the Lord, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great word, for the battle is not yours. It belongs to God. I want to read that again. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great word, for the battle is not yours. It belongs to God. Sometimes we take up situations that happen around us. Sometimes we try to fight some battle that we can't, we don't even have no control over. Brethren, if we can learn to allow difficult situations to become the reminders for us to worship God, we can defeat Satan, use of fear and discouragement in our lives. And if you read further down, when Jehoshaphat heard the declaration of the Lord, his heart was filled with joy. Because when, he, when you when trouble faces you and you hear that somebody will face the trouble for you, brethren, all you can do is rejoice. Jehoshaphat was over, so overjoyed that all he could do was fall on his face and worship. And the people worship. 
and the praise team worship. And everybody give worship unto God. I can imagine how they worship because they knew in whom they trust. And they were persu persuaded that he will deliver. And if we read down to verse 21 to 24, it teaches us that the singers praise and worship God in a loud voice continually and in the end the enemy was defeated may i encourage you this morning to read the entire chapter of second chronicles and see the god we serve we are confronted with fears daily and we have fought many needless battles in our life but may I tell you this morning that God is not the author of fear. When fear comes, it is not of God. It is the enemy seeking to defear, de defeat us. Because he knows that if, if him can get we to be fearful, just one little toops. We are overpowered. So this morning I ask the question, what are your fears today? You may be faced with some sort of fear. Fear your children don't seem to be going in the wrong direction. Fear of getting sick, fear of losing your job, fear of being embarrassed, fear of being rejected, Fear of not being able to pay your bills. Pay, fear of not serving God correctly. Fear of even witnessing. Fear of getting married. Fear of COVID-19. And the fear of COVID-19 is so much that we are fearing dying. Fear dying. Fear can immobilize us, brethren. Fear. Fear comes in many shapes and forms. Fear can prevent us from going. Fear can prevent us from coming. But I say to you again, emphatically, brethren, anytime fears enter your domain, it is not from God. There are situations in our life that we just can't change. Some things are beyond, beyond our ability to change. Sometimes it makes no sense we fight because it is not ours, not our fight. It belongs to God. When you are faced with circumstances, when you are cornered by fear, remember the Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he will lift up a standard against him. Call out to God as David did in Psalms 27 when he said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, came upon me and to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Call upon God, brethren. Use his words to defeat the enemy. There are times when we just need to relax, call on God, and say to God, fight this one for me. May I remind you, as Paul said to his son Timothy, in first Timothy verse one, chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's why I know that fear is not from God. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. He is not the author of fear. Fear that brings on that strong danger emotion. It is not from God. It is from the devil. And the devil will continue to talk fear into you. But you need to attack and counter it with the blood of Jesus. So I encourage you this morning to replace your fear with prayer and fasting. Praise gives us access to God and gets his attention. 
make up a prayer song. Sing that my son will be okay. Sing that I will get this job. Make up a prayer song. Make up a prayer song. Praise God that your children will achieve. Praise God that my children will be a good person in the society. Praise that they can do all things who gives who, through Christ who gives them the strength. You are here today. You are in this building today. And you have not surrendered your heart to the Lord. Jesus went on Calvary's cross to redeem you and to redeem me. And this morning, the only thing that you can do is to give him your heart. The possibility is there that you fear the only reason that you have not given him your heart is fear. Fear of what others may say. Fear of losing your friends. Fear of fear that your support system will be no more. Would you allow the Lord this morning to strengthen your faith? I share with you that you will never be ashamed this morning if you commit your heart to the Lord. If you give him what he deserves. The, the song this morning says, you were not created to worry. You were not created to fear. This morning, I encourage you, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I will invite you to come to the altar this morning just to show the enemy that you, your fear is no more. I am going to put my trust and my confidence in God. The God that Jehoshaphat prayed to. The God that our forefathers put their trust in. And the one that we are serving today, brethren. Give your heart to the Lord. So let me recap. My brothers and sisters, in order for us to overcome fear, we must pray fast, call on the brethren to stand with you, and believe that when you go through the waters, he will be with you, and through the fires, through the rivers, you will not be overflowed, and through the fire, you will not be burned, and the fl flame will not consume you. The Lord bless you this morning as you trust God and fear no more.